This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Like most people, I had my first exposure to imaginary numbers in high school. And like most people, this was my response. Okay. Fast forward a few years into my physics degree and we start using imaginary numbers in things like wave mechanics and quantum physics. Strange sentences start popping up like the wave phase is imaginary and quantum states are complex. It was here that I really started to question what this whole imaginary number thing actually meant. Did part of the wave not exist? Did quantum states need therapy? It's now been three years since I finished my physics degree and about three weeks ago I was taken by this sudden urge to get to the bottom of what these imaginary number things were. So let's start with the name, imaginary. In my opinion, this is the worst possible name that anybody could have come up with in the history of anything ever. It makes things so confusing because they're just as imaginary as any other number. Or as real, depending on how you look at things. You can't point to anything in the real world and say, that's a seven or that's a two. You can point to seven puppies or the symbol that represents a two, but the concepts of the numbers themselves aren't tangible, physical things. Now, does this mean they're not real? Well, not necessarily. It depends what school of thought you prefer. That's right, there are whole schools of thought around mathematical philosophy. If you're a non-Platonist, you think that numbers are merely inventions by humans, used to keep track of situations. If you're a Platonist, on the other hand, you think that numbers exist independent of humans and were discovered, not invented. Neither of these views is necessarily the right one, just different ways of thinking about what numbers are. Now the problem that I have is that by giving them the name imaginary, it's somehow implying that they're different or less natural than the other numbers, but they're not. To demonstrate this, let's start with something more familiar. The negative numbers. We're pretty used to the idea of them now, but imagine the first time they were introduced. What does negative 50 physically represent? How can you have less than nothing? This little minus sign might seem pretty innocent, but for people in the 1700s, it was a big shift in mentality that took years to sink in. The old English mathematician Francis Mazarus said they darkened the whole doctrine of the equations. So why were they introduced then? Well, they're very useful. A negative sign can represent things like debt and direction effortlessly. Instead of always having to say, I owe $50, your bank account just says negative $50 and it's obvious what it means. It's easy to keep track of and simple to do calculations with. We use them so much today that we don't even think to question them. The same story is true for the irrationals or square roots. When the ancient Greeks realized that the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle with sides of length one couldn't be expressed as a ratio of two numbers, they were so upset they drowned the discoverer in the Mediterranean Sea. But square roots of things are so useful. Any Pythagorean fan will tell you that. It would be very limiting in today's world if we didn't have them. And it's exactly the same thing with the imaginary numbers. They were introduced as a means to answer questions that wouldn't be possible without them, like, what is the square root of a negative number? Now this idea might seem outrageous. You want the square root of less than nothing? But we perform operations on negative numbers all the time. If you want to represent a doubling in debt, you multiply a negative number by two and this represents the new amount that you owe. We just multiplied a quantity less than nothing. It's not too much of a stretch of the imagination that sometimes we'd need to take the square root of a quantity less than nothing. So just like with all the other numbers, humans thought of a way to do just that. Now let's get on to what this imaginary number i really is. First, let's start with what it really means to square something. Take this example, x squared equals 25. Now the left-hand side of this equation can actually be broken up into three components, x times x times one. I'm including the one here for a reason, so just sit tight. So what does this literally mean? Well, the most basic way to look at it is, what number can we multiply one by twice to turn it into 25? If you've done any basic high school math, you'll know that there are two answers, five and negative five. Five times one takes you to five, and then times five again takes you to 25. Negative five times one takes you to negative five, and then times by negative five again flips the sign back and takes you to 25. Pretty straightforward. But now what about this? X squared equals negative one. 
What number, when I multiply twice, turns 1 into negative 1? Well, it's not 1 because we just end up with 1 again. And it's not negative 1 because the sign flips twice and we end up with 1. Now here's where the really important and novel idea comes in, which I have no idea why they didn't tell us in school. What if we do a rotation? Who says we have to stick to the number line? What if we enter the netherworld above or below? What if instead of only flipping, we can rotate? If we do two 90 degree rotations, we can turn one into negative one. That's what the number I means, a 90 degree rotation about the real number axis. Hence, I done twice, or squared, is equal to negative one. We're used to thinking of numbers on a line, but with the introduction of imaginary numbers, they actually exist on a two-dimensional plane. Yeah, numbers are two-dimensional. Who would have thought? They're made up of the real axis and the imaginary axis, and you can transit from one to the other by rotating. So what are imaginary numbers good for? Well, what are negative numbers good for? One thing they're really good at is keeping track of the sign of an alternating system, like a light switch. If we keep multiplying by a negative number, we get a pretty obvious pattern. 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. So negative numbers can keep track of any system that toggles. What about when we multiply by the imaginary number i? We get 1, i, negative 1, negative i, 1, i, negative 1, negative i. There's a pretty obvious pattern here too. Imaginary numbers are good for keeping track of systems that rotate. We're just not as familiar with these types of systems because they're introduced in higher physics like quantum systems and wave mechanics. Now, if you've heard of imaginary numbers, you've probably also heard of complex numbers. These are just numbers that have a real and imaginary component. I was once tutoring a student who was having a hard time with these and he said, I can see why they're called complex numbers, but they're actually not called complex numbers because they're complicated. It's the same kind of complex as in a housing complex, in that one whole can consist of different parts. Numbers can consist of a real and imaginary part, hence complex numbers. To be honest, this knowledge probably won't help you get better grades, but hopefully by taking a peek at the intuition, you'll be able to have more of an appreciation for these guys than I ever did. I'm a huge fan of intuition over rote learning, and a resource I use for that exact reason is brilliant.org. Brilliant is an interactive learning website which focuses on problem solving and deep understanding rather than memorizing trivial facts and rules. There are tons of courses to choose from, mainly on math, physics and computer science. The latest thing I've become obsessed with are these daily problems, which are a great way to stay sharp. And nothing gives you deeper intuition than putting your problem solving skills to the test. See if you can solve what happens if you cut a Mobius strip in half, or how many squares in this grid contain the blue square. Signing up is free, but for a 20% discount off their premium membership, be one of the first 200 to sign up using this link. Just go to brilliant.org slash up and atom. You can find it below in the description. Are there any other concepts that you don't really get, even though you might use them every day? If there are, let me know in the comments and maybe we can tackle them together. Until next time, bye.